And now for our feature presentation. The barbershop is one place where it's pretty much nothing is off limits. I mean, women, sports, politics, work, whatever, what you just ate. You can talk about anything in the barbershop, man. It's just a lot of different emotions. People get mad, people fight. You know, it's just life, man. It's just real life, man. all in one, one room. When you're in the barbershop and you're talking about certain things, or you're having an issue with your girl, or you're having an issue that something's going on with work or money or something like that, nine times out of 10, somebody else having that same problem. So I think if we start talking about mental health issues in the barbershop, I'll come in the barbershop, I'm like, hey, I go to counseling once a week. That's something that I do on a regular. That'll promote other people to at least try it. Because you can see, we're still like-minded people, but this is something that I know that helps me out, so it may help you out as well. Do you think that we're losing the barbershop? For us, it's something that you know, we look back on. Do you think that it's kind of changed, or good or bad? In some instances, yeah. People now, they want to get in and get out. On a day-to-day -day basis, just our communication skills and our interactions are becoming less and less frequent because we're always in our phone. We might be communicating per se with people, but we're communicating with people three hours away on Twitter instead of the people that are three feet away in your face. It leads to diminished communication skills. You don't know how to really talk to people. You can type to people, but you can't talk to people. And then that leads to more discomfort and opening up and having real conversations. I'm sure that a barber can tell you that they, they probably recycle a conversation 20 times a day. And it's probably about the same thing, the latest sport event that went on or politics or something like that. So they never get to the point where you can get into those in-depth conversations because you constantly have these different people coming in and out. This is in y'all backyard, bruh. Like black in America, right? <laughs> Unless you're us, nobody really understands that, like, you have to worry about how people perceive you. And being aware of too much can, like, put an enormous amount of strain 
or your mental. Just having to constantly be reminded, you know, act this way so I don't get killed when I get pulled over for a broken tail light. This way so this white lady will feel comfortable. I gotta be this hard cat because I'm in this area. I gotta be this point dexter because I'm in this area. It makes you wonder, does anyone else have to go through this? To see the violence so blatantly against our people is tragic but it's not a surprise to me. It's something that has been going on for years. Like, say the whole police brutality on black people. I mean, that's been going on since forever in America for us, you know, but it was, there was no Twitter, there was no iPhone, there was nothing to capture that type of stuff. So like our generation now is just completely outraged out of nowhere. And Although, you know, we had certain laws and stuff passed and we, we think that, you know, our country is progressing. Some people are just now seeing that things really haven't changed that much. It's hard to change the foundation that it was built on. Uh, why do you think that we as a community are afraid to talk about mental health? We as a black community are scared to talk about mental health because, for one, we don't understand it. You understand a broken arm, you understand a broken leg. You know what I'm saying? But don't nobody understand, you know, mental health. We have this perception that's based off of a bunch of stigmas. Words that really don't describe what mental health is. And it's something that we try to avoid. We try to protect ourselves by not addressing certain things that may leave us vulnerable. Everybody's looking for you to consistently be strong. And you can't be weak at all. So if you're weak, you get ridiculed. And if you express that to try to get help, it's like nobody understands because miraculously everybody is Superman and don't nobody go through those problems. And this this the real world, we got real shit to deal with. But nigga, if I ain't here to deal with this real shit, then what's the point? I don't even know if it's just a black thing. Maybe it's just a people thing where somehow when we get close to each other, but instead of showing each other love, we ridiculed each other, almost as a means to try to make each other stronger. But what happens is it spirals into the only way that we communicate. And when you put in that much negativity into the people that you love, you realize that you never learn to communicate in a, in a healthy way. Instead of taking a step back and actually being honest, like, hey man, you didn't have to say all that, you didn't have to take it that far. I mean, I know we just playing, but that, that really, that was a sensitive topic to me. No, I'm coming for your neck. I know I'm gonna go say what I know is gonna hurt you. And it's cool while we all together, but when each of us goes home, we all running back through our heads. Man, everybody was laughing at me today about my biggest shortcoming. And so talking about mental health, man, if you don't know how to show love, if you don't know how to speak love, we're not, talk, we not talking about healing mental health, you know, you know what I'm saying? Because that's what a lot of people need, is to, to feel that somebody loves them. Because I guess that's just vital. <laughs> KT. 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 Um, the ego gets in the way because it tells you that you don't need help. It allows you to tell yourself that I'm going to be okay but you can't be okay if you're not doing anything actively to make certain changes in your life. You don't have mental health problems. You got problems with police profiling. You got problems with discrimination, trying to get a job. When that stuff is always cast to the forefront and you do have to deal with that stuff and you put the stuff you have to deal with to yourself to the side. I can handle me, but I'm gonna take care of them first. So you kind of forget about all the things you got going on inside your own head and inside your own mind. And it just, it all kind of compiles and adds up. It's like an egg. <laughs> you're that yolk that's in the egg before it's cracked, right? But to the world, you're a hard shell. You know what I mean? You, yourself, in that environment, don't even know how fragile you are until you get out of that environment. But once you're out, I don't think people understand how much of pressure and, and a burden is taken off your shoulders. Just knowing that you're not the only one that's going through things or thinking about things from a negative perception. One thing that I've learned is just to be honest when I feel something is accept that and, and learn how to cope with it in a positive manner. So, I mean, everything's not gonna make you happy. Everything's not gonna make you mad. So, I mean, take the, take the good with the good and the bad with the bad, um, but, but keep going. Do you feel there's a need to revise our societal views of masculinity? Yeah, definitely. I mean, men are 
It's supposed to be the backbone. Emotions are for women. You know, like, what are you crying for? We definitely have to revise the way we, we look at things like that when it comes to men because it just leads to over-aggression and people trying to overcompensate because they're really hiding skeletons in their closet or problems that they're going through, um, but they don't know how to deal with them or address them because they're not supposed to have emotions and, and feelings. You're not supposed to be sad. You're supposed to just be tough. In reality, that's not possible. Everybody has their own struggles. Everybody's going through something. I had men in my life. My father was around, but it was more of a fact of having a man there and him showing you how to be a man. But then as I look at it, my uncles, my grandfather, all of their, their ways of being a man doesn't encompass actually dealing with emotions and feelings. You put that to the back burner. That's not something that we as men address. We don't feel emotions. You don't cry. You don't get hurt. You don't experience pain. Or if you do, you don't tell anybody. Just for the simple fact that you never want to show nobody your weakness. Watching that, like mentally, that's putting into you that men don't cry. You hold that in. And when you hold that in, you're going to explode. Some way, shape, form, or fashion, no matter how you do that, whether you explode women, whether you turn to drugs, whether you turn to violence, whether you just become an introvert, some way, shape, or form, that explosion is going to happen. And that's something that as I grew older and went through my own emotional struggles, I realized that we are people and we all experience feelings and emotions and it's something that we have to address. And being able to address them doesn't make you weak, it just makes you stronger. Small diagnosis can pretty much make you a black sheep in your family or turn you off from people that you want to be. Women don't want to be associated with somebody that's got a type of disorder or they feel that's quote unquote crazy or they they not emotionally or mentally stable but this nigga got a six pack you know what i'm saying or, or this nigga took a gun or he play basketball he run fast jump high he got all the ladies you know what i'm saying like that's masculine the only way that i could get people to get help was for me to share my own story just one night i typed it up and decided to put it on a blog the name of the blog is Monumental, Monumental. Having everybody on one accord and making sure that we address mental health issues because it's a community thing. It's something that affects everybody, not just one person, not just one group, not just one gender, not just one social class. It affects everybody. So we all need to be on one accord. So that's what prompted me to start my blog and start the nonprofit work that I started to do, doing speaking engagements and talking with kids, talking with adults, just to raise mental health awareness. Oh, wow, okay. Okay, all right. I got you. Six events, got first in all six. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's pretty dope. Bruh, like 4.0 student, bruh. <laughs> we ran track, played football. Like, bruh, like, how, my nigga? Like, like what was your motivation? Like, what drove you? Like, what about here can you attribute to that, like, drive, you know? Man, we never, we never had that. Mm -hmm. So we took pride in whatever we did. Right. Just because of the simple fact that if you don't have anything, you gotta, t you know, the stuff that you do have, you gotta cherish it. Especially here at Burt T. Like, that's what we cherish. I'm from Burt T. We represented that name, we bled blue. When it came down to the classroom, Mom Dukes won't go for that. Right. So, <laughs> right. You won't, you won't able to bleed blue if you ain't get your work done. So, that's what it was.
As Casey stated, September is Suicide Awareness Month. And actually today is World Suicide Prevention Awareness Day. So the reason why we wanted to make sure that we had this event today is because mental health and mental illness is something that is very important to us, although we may not acknowledge it, especially in our community. Whether it's being a rural community or whether it's being a minority community, we don't talk about it enough. Hence the reason why our shirts say, let's talk about it. Back in 2007, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. It was something that actually scared me because I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know if people would actually just call me crazy because I, I mean, I tried to hide it for the longest. From the outside looking in, I mean, you may think that everything is perfect. And a lot of times we try to make those assumptions about other people that everything is perfect, but you never know what, what this person may be going through. In 2007, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I was a sophomore in, in college, and it was something that scared me because I didn't know what it was. My first thought was that I was crazy. And then the next thought, I was like, no, not me. It can't be me. Went through a denial phase, didn't want to believe it went through a stage where I didn't want people to know that I was actually diagnosed. I ended up leaving school, started doing counseling. Things started to, you know, look up. So I went back to school. Once I was around people, everything went south again because I didn't know how to deal with it. And I didn't want people to know. So the logic in my head, I was like, I'm better now. I get off medication, stop going to see therapists. I went through a stage where it was a severe depression and I felt like I couldn't do anything right. I felt like things weren't going my way. I just didn't want to be here anymore. So during those stages, I attempted to die by suicide twice by pills, doing the same vicious cycle. The last time I tried to die by suicide the third time and I used to own a gun. I cocked the gun back, put it to my head, and pulled the trigger. It didn't discharge. And during that time, I was like, man, I can't even do anything right. I can't even, I want to take my own life, and I can't even do that right. I've had some experiences with that with my family. Like, I had a cousin not too long ago committed suicide, he killed himself. And it's like, once those things happen, you know, hindsight's always 20 20. Look, go back on his Facebook page and all those days, you're like, man, this dude's wild and he's crazy. Like, laughing though, because he's laughing, but he's not really laughing. He's just making it seem that way to hide. Your mind racing leads you to short sightedness, making quick decisions that have permanent solutions. Those type of permanent decisions offer some simple shit. We talking like my rent was $300 my G. You know what I'm saying? I was ready to end it all. That brought on for your mind running. You might run a thousand miles an hour, three hundred dollars. You make a permanent solution with permanent pain that goes along with it. Things like that, man. That 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 was one of the things that really kind of opened my eyes and made me want to to be more proactive and and for one, examining my own self, and then also those I care about and those around me. So I felt like I lost so much control over my life, and when I did try to take control and end it, it still didn't happen. So from there, that's when I started to really get back into therapy and get back on medication and really start to focus on myself and getting better, increasing my own mental health. And once I started to get better, I was looking at the world through a different lens. I could start to pick up on different signs and symptoms in other people just for the simple fact that I've been there. It's very important for me to continue to share my story because I never know who ears it may fall on. And I wanted to promote to people to actually just talk about this stuff. You never know a life you may save or just you may help somebody out because a lot of times, I know I did, I felt like I was alone. But we're not because I know what it's like to live here and I know what it's like to come from here. I know what it's like to be a black man. I know what it's like to be a black person around here. And then it gets hard. I want to let you all know that's why the reason, the reason why we have these vendors here is to let you know that there are resources here for you. Everybody may not know what Trillium does. Everybody may not know what Revelation Peak Performance does, but that's the reason why they're here. 
physical health and mental health, they're synonymous. A lot of times we try to focus on, oh, I want to get on a diet, I want to start working out. What are you doing to protect your own mental health as well? Working with each other, we can definitely impact a lot of people, not just the black community, not just the male community. A lot of people need to hear this story and needs to hear the importance of taking care of ourselves mentally. I think that's how you teach the youth how to deal with mental health. You show them that healing is better than hurting. As we learn to deal with it more effectively, naturally that's just gonna be passed on to those that come after us. But being able to like know that you have support and it's other people that feel like you, it kind of puts a healthy responsibility on you to like to deal with you so that you can be strong enough to help your brother deal with himself. Showing people that it is okay to feel certain ways. It's okay to feel emotions. It's okay to actually talk about them. It's okay to go to a counselor. It's okay to get on medication. It's okay to figure out what's going on, what's wrong with you. Then do the necessary things to make sure you feel better. I'm gonna tell you, when he came in April and he spoke, like my mom was very emotional. And I'm thinking she's emotional because I'm like, she, she listening to her relatives share a story. But what she said was, I was battling depression at the time. And, and to hear it was almost like a burden lifted off my shoulders. And she was like, I needed it. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like every time he shares a story, man, he reaches somebody and then it's just giving them the opportunity to share their story. And that's what people need. Like, and, and after the event was over, man, she just sat there and she just cried like uncontrollably. And I was just like, man, this is what it's all about right here. You know, getting people to embrace it and getting people to understand that, man, it's okay. You know, let's just talk about it, man. And, and he sat there for about 20 minutes, man, just talked to my mom, like so passionately looking into her eyes, just like, man, it's, it's, it's okay. Yeah. And that's what it's about right there, yeah. man. That's what it's about. What your movement has done is made me kind of take a more in-depth look at myself and I've kind of realized like through your story why I've done some of the things I've done or why I do some of the things I do and what are the root causes of those actions. It's a great feeling. For one, I feel like I'm serving a purpose and it's something that is definitely needed because I want people to actually start the conversation. Discuss certain things that are going on in your life. Talk with your close ones about it, your family members, your children, your aunts, uncles, parents, close friends. Not saying that you should bog them down with all of your things that you have going on, but sometimes you may have to get certain things off of your chest. And if it's come to a point where that doesn't work, you may need to seek counseling. So it's, it's been very therapeutic for myself, not only just to share my story and continue doing what I'm doing, but just to see people are actually listening to what I'm saying and they're taking heed and trying to better themselves mentally. Mental health and mental illness is something that is vital to not only our community, but it's vital to everybody. It's something that affects each and every person. And as you can see, it definitely affects the male population. As you watch these videos and it sparks a, a creation that you want to share with us, send it to us via this email. It could be a voice recording, it could be a video recording, or even if it's something that you want to type up as far as poetry or anything of that nature. Send it to us and we'll, and we'll put it out there. I would like to thank UFR uh, in conjunction with Monumental, Monumental, The Cutting Room, definitely uh, for letting us use their shop. I appreciate you watching. Next time on UFR.